Welcome to the latest episode of In With The Old. We're a video podcast focused on dispelling myths, building appreciation for God's word, and helping you rediscover the Old Testament for the life of faith. So today we have a Q&A episode. These episodes are chances for you as our listeners and viewers to submit the questions that you have about the Bible. Today we have a good one. Normally we like to take about three questions at a time, but this question is probably going to take us the whole time to cover. Helping me out with this, as always, is my co-host, Dr. Tim Howe. Dr. Tim, how are you doing today? Well, Brian, I am doing very well, and uh, this is a topic today uh, that that really uh, stirs up some fire in people. It's, it's one of the earliest mysteries yes. in, in terms of the book of Genesis and, and what on earth is going on. Uh, so today we're talking about the Nephilim or the Nephilim. And so, uh, Brian, I'll turn back over to you and you can kind of orient us to this discussion, maybe a little bit of debate today, but a fun topic as we consider who were the Nephilim. Yeah, so this is a fun question. Although this is probably not the most contentious question we've ever covered, Tim, uh, <laughs> this is certainly a debate that I, that I usually like to say generates a lot of heat, not always a lot of light. So <laughs> listeners, we're talking today, the question came in asking us who or what are the Nephilim? Well, to answer that, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter six. I'm going to read a couple verses for us, but it might help to have the passage in front of you. So in Genesis chapter 6, we've obviously gone through the creation story, the fall, and the generations proceeding from Adam and Eve. And now we're setting up the flood. As a preface to this flood story in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6, we get this kind of interesting aside. And I want to read it for us from the English Standard Version. It says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. And they took, as their wa- uh, t- they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. That alone has its own interesting interpretive things, but here's where our question comes in. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of, who were of old the men of renown. So it's that phrase, Nephilim. We're wondering who these things are. So they're mentioned here in Genesis 6-4. They are also mentioned again in Numbers 13-33. We're going to deal with them primarily here and then kind of cast an eye based on our answer, who or what we think is happening in Numbers 13. Now, anytime you come to the Old Testament and you see a word that ends in em, the Nephilim, the Seraphim, the cherubim, Elohim, anything like that. What do we have going on? Well, we have what's called a transliteration. That means this is the actual Hebrew vocalization, the letters, if you will, being brought into English rather than the meaning of the word being brought across. This often happens with names or key terms that our translators think are important to preserve rather than giving a meaning for the phrase. So, This clues us in right here. This is, in the minds of your translators, an important term, a key term, a proper noun, if you will. But who are they? Well, Tim, uh, there are a couple different (laughs) interpretive options. I'll I'll, I'll actually kick over to you if you don't mind. Can you give us kind of just the generic, what are some maybe background bits of information we should know before we dig into our interpretive options? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. So this is where we uh, we get to enter into the minefield, right? Th- th- this is one of those passages that just in in you know a few verses presents probably a hundred interpretive questions. Uh, but when we try and figure out, okay, who are the Nephilim? As you mentioned, it's basically a straight transliteration uh, from Hebrew to English, and uh, the root of the word is, of course, the word uh, nephal, right, which is then made into a plural substantive, which is just a way to say that it's it's made into a, a person or personages. Uh, the fallen ones is literally what Nephilim means. 
Uh, and so that doesn't really give us a lot of description. What, what does it mean, fallen ones? Uh, and then, of course, as we think about the way that that's kind of gone through the translation history, some translations following the Septuagint will say the giants that were in the land mm -hmm. of that time. And so uh, this is one of those things where we're like, well, giants? Who are the giants? And what does it mean that they were fallen? Uh, and then it says they were men of renown, which literally means men of name. So we've got a lot of translation issues. Then we've got a lot of uh, just mystery. And, and what does it mean that the sons of God were involved? So uh, it's kind of uh, an enigma wrapped in a mystery about something that's very intriguing. And of course, it takes place right before the flood. So uh, just again, to whet the appetite, what on earth is going on? Uh, that's really the question that we're trying to uh, wrestle with today. But here, here are some basic in interpretive options. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the LXX, right, the Septuagint translates it giants. And, uh, and as we think about that idea, we have a lot of Jewish history uh, that, that really helps us to see how many of the Jewish people thought of these giants or thought of these Nephilim. And that's where I'd like to start for just a second, Brian. Uh, when it comes to Jewish interpretive history, the the fascinating interpretation is they believed or seem to believe that these were fallen angels, right? The sons of God often refers to angels in scripture. And so the Jewish tradition by and large says these were fallen angels, fallen sons of God uh, who fell because they became attracted to women. And, uh, and because of that attraction came and had children with those women. Uh, and so many people and many believers today believe this is one of the strangest, uh, you know, strangest things that's happened in all of human biological history, that you have fallen angels who are procreating with human women and they give rise to a race of giants or Nephilim or powerful people. Uh, and so that's why that interpretation, that, that strangeness of it, uh, really is what piques the interest of many of us. Now, I've gotten into a lot of things uh, that, that we were kind of saving for later, but Brian, I'll kick it back to you. Uh, <laughs> but but it, as we think about this, uh, there's so much mystery. So let's try and pick it apart a little bit, and I'll, I'll let you head us off on that, Brian. Okay, yeah. So Tim actually mentioned in passing there two of the four kind of major interpretive options that we have, giants mm -hmm. or fallen angels. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's unpack these a little bit. The first interpretive option is, as Tim said, giants. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation uh, that would have been operative during the time of Jesus, um, the Greek translation uses the word gigantes, which simply means giants, right? Um, there is some additional argument for this. Michael Heiser, uh, the late Michael Heiser, actually, he passed away this year. Um, mm -hmm. This was one of his key points, among others, that he said, look, the word Nephilim, usually we view as being derived from the Hebrew verb nephal. And as Tim walked us through that, but he said it might instead be from the Aramaic Nephilim, which does mean giant. And that would make sense with why then the Greek translators picked the word giants instead of picking like a form of the verb to fall. So in this case, uh, the what's going on here is these are giants. These are um, imposing figures. These are men of renown, men of the name. File that away for later, because I think that's going to be something important in helping us understand the meaning of the passage. But what's going on here then is a description of this antediluvian or before the flood world where you have these just awesome beings of power and might, but look at how fallen they are. Um, mm. Starting in the third century, this became a popular interpretation amongst the church fathers. If you read their works on the books of Genesis, um, it is important to note that the word giant is not an ethnic description, but a physical description. Because remember, the flood is about to come and kill them all off. You may ask <laughs> then, who are the Nephilim in Numbers 13 that the spies see? Well, if it's a physical description, these are not the literal like descendants of these Nephilim here in Genesis 6. They're merely giants, which we do know with Goliath are there in the promised land. So that's kind of interpretive option number one. There's also some other arguments uh, about uh, derivations of the term. Listeners, Tim and I talked about this before the podcast started. This is a debate 
that we can get deep into the weeds very quickly. <laughs> so sorry, I'm kind of trying to self edit and not go down all the possible routes we have here. We'll just say option one, as attested by the Greek reading and possibly an Aramaic uh, rendering of the term here, could lead us to say that these are giants. So that's option one. Option two is to say that these Nephilim, this is a term simply for fallen humans. These are the children of the Sethite and Canaanite lines of humanity. So rolling back a little bit, right? We come out of the fall. We have Cain and Abel. Abel dies and is replaced by Seth. You then have these kind of two lineages, right, Tim, going forward. You have mm -hmm. the children descended from Cain. We can call them Cainites. Um, or then the children of Seth, Sethites. The Nephilim in Genesis 6, listeners, if you still have your Bible open, seem to be implied, although no, not explicitly stated, but seem to be implied as the product of the sons of God and the daughters of man. Now, that phrase sons of God most often means an angelic referent. We'll deal with that in a moment. But it could instead be taken as a circumlocution for the sons of Seth, right? The line that is following after God. They're the sons of God, with the daughters of men being those descended from Cain. It's talking about what the story would mean then is that this is a story talking about how the people of Seth did not remain following after God, but we see the fall corrupting even them so that there is almost no one left that falls after God, save for our protagonist who we're about to meet, Noah. <laughs> right? So that's how you could interpret this passage. Tim, maybe help us fill this out a little bit. The children of Seth versus the daughters of Cain interpretation. Yeah, so proponents of, of this interpretation would basically point at the genealogical nature of Genesis up to this point, uh, that going all the way back to uh, basically the end of Genesis 3 and the beginning of Genesis 4, you have Cain and Abel. Abel dies. Seth is then given to Adam and Eve in place of Abel. And from there, you have the Cainite line that's described in Genesis chapter 4, uh, but it's really described in tragic terms. Cain kills Abel, but by the time you get to the seventh generation after Cain, you've got Lamech, who then is this mass murderer, uh, or at least mm -hmm. someone who, who is boasting about being a murderer, uh, as well as someone who really taunts his wives. Uh, in, in other words, Cain, he's really bad, but it gets worse from there. Uh, whereas Seth in the Sethite line, and we see this in, in Genesis chapter five, uh, there's at least some indications of righteousness. In particular, you have Enoch, who is in the Sethite line, who walks with God. Uh, and so you have this sense that the Cainite line is wicked. You've got at least some righteousness in the Sethite line, uh, at which point that is, is why perhaps the Sethite line would be described as sons of God, as opposed to the daughters of man. So just to clarify for our readers, um, Adam is described as being made in the image and likeness of God, both in Genesis chapter one, Adam's name is not mentioned in Genesis one, but then in Genesis five, his name is mentioned arguably. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's said to be in the likeness of God, uh, which even something like Luke chapter three really seems to interpret as the son of God. Uh, so for our, our listeners, if you go to Luke three and you read the genealogy of Jesus, Adam is described as a son of God. So yeah. again, to summarize Genesis chapter six, it could be that sons of God refers to the Sethite line, the righteous line, or at least the line in which there is some righteousness uh, and daughters of men could refer to the Canaanite line. Now and, there's different, there's and, and, different. Yeah. Sorry, Tim, didn't mean 